Hello, Dr. Dyke Drummond here at the home of TheHappyMD.com in beautiful Seattle, Washington. Welcome to the latest episode of the Physicians on Purpose podcast. Tools so you can recognize and prevent your own burnout. Stories of burnout put to its highest and best use and wellness leadership strategies. Everything you need to be a physician on purpose. Hello again, Dr. Dyke Drummond here from beautiful Seattle, Washington, the home of thehappymd.com, latest edition of the Physicians on Purpose podcast. And man, I am chomping at the bit today because I have Christopher Habig here, who is the CEO and founder of Freedom HealthWorks. And what we're going to talk about is direct primary care as the future of medicine in the United States of America and perhaps the entire world. And I finally, after having supported a number of doctors who went into direct primary care and concierge practice over the last 13 years of my burnout prevention work, finally, I've found somebody who's put together a package of services to support DPC that puts it within the grasp of a whole big bunch of you primary care doctors in the United States. And I just want to have an interview with Chris and hear his story and tell you what they offer at Freedom HealthWorks. By the way, I do not have any financial relationship with Freedom HealthWorks. I'm just excited because I think this drops the option of DPC into anybody's lap who's willing to continue to grow and learn how to have productive, collaborative relationships with your patients. Chris, welcome to the show. Dr. Drummond, pleasure to be here. Thank you for the kind words. That uh that was the best introduction I think I've ever had. So <laughs> I, I'm thrilled to thrilled to be joining you here. And um, I get to to wake up every day and help people like your audience take back medicine. And it's a very rewarding career. That's funny. I just commissioned a a uh, a, a, a logo that has a fist with a stethoscope in it, and it says "Physicians Unite, Defend the Practice." Right now, quick confession. For all of you who are not Hoosiers, I'm I'm so sorry that you missed out on that opportunity to be born in the great state of Indiana. We're both Hoosiers. Yay. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And the, the Indiana State Fair just ended too. So if you didn't make it back, you missed uh, that just treasure, absolute treasure of our fine state. Right on. And tell, tell us a little bit about growing up as a doctor's son in central Indiana. The apple a day never, ever kept the doctor away is, is the easy part to say that one there. So uh, mom and dad are both physicians still practicing. Uh, it, no secret that they're practicing as Freedom Health Works clients. Um, dad's family med and mom's an internist and started up to different hospital programs and physician networks, all that kind of fun stuff. And, uh, you know, I was the kid who basically grew up in the doctor's office. So if anybody remembered um, going to a doctor's office and the family was around, you know, small town, that was me running around on the stools and, you know, uh, seeing how many, you know, cotton swabs I could chuck down the hallway and, you know, fit in my mouth, that kind of thing. The, uh, the school bus would drop me off at my dad's office. And so I grew up with this concept of what a physician did for the community, not just you know, what they do day in, day out, you know, treating people, the actual practice of it. But I learned what it was when a physician was a pillar of a community. The, you know, dad would do the Friday night football games. Um, you know, my mom was was a, a pretty big, you know, uh, not necessarily a celebrity, but everybody knew her, you know, in the town next to ours that where she was working and setting up hospitals. So I grew up with this concept that Physicians are the most well-respected people in the community. They are the most intelligent. They take care of everybody. They're the most kind, giving people, empathetic. Phone rings at 3 a.m. They're taking the call. And we kind of joked that, you know, I I would get sick and I'd have to go to school and just hang out in the nurse's office all day. Or it's, hey, Chris is really sick. Give him a couple of Advil and we're going to go to bed kind of kind of stick. Where I would see that the care that the the patients got, you know, just top level patients. My parents were bending over backwards. I, I short story, long story short, I I thought that's what physicians did, and so I grew up with this. I'm the the youngest of three. Uh, my brother or sister didn't go into medicine, so I was looking at. I'm like, I'm going to be a doctor, following mom and dad's footsteps. Not necessarily take over the family business, but I, just that that feeling and that witnessing of 
wow, mom and dad are so important to so many people out there. I want that. I want to change people's lives. And then I fast forward, I get to undergrad, I start shadowing doctors and hospital systems and this, everybody's miserable. And this is like 2008, 2009, everybody's miserable. And there wasn't a single physician that I met who said, I would go back and do medical school again. They said, Chris, don't go to medical school. You're going to hate it. Our profession has changed that much. Go be a lawyer, go to business school, go do something else. And so I, I, I like can just, 22. I can just hear it. It's like, Chris, I know your mom and dad really well. I love them. Whatever you do, don't go to medical school. <laughs> and, and, and they said, you know, they would kind of, they would, they would dodge that question a lot. They're like, well, you know, medicine's still a great career. You could have a great family. And I see them, you know, they're working 14 hours a day, seeing 30 people in their own practice. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Like, this isn't, this isn't happiness. Like I, this isn't what I want. And so opted for a different route. And so healthcare has always been near and dear to my heart. And so, you know, my journey found me in a position where, you know, if I would have become a physician, I could help out hundreds, or hundreds, maybe thousands of people get better. But now I'm in a position where I can help out tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of patients, maybe millions someday. And we get to help out hundreds of physicians. And, you know, a good friend of mine, um, a couple of years ago, he said, Chris, what you guys have built here is a mechanism to help heal our healers. And that stuck with me. And that's why, you know what, this does feel like we're on a mission. We got to fight burnout. We got to keep physicians in practice. We got to keep them help healthier. We got to keep them in a good spot so that they actually can take care of my kids and future generations rather than continue the path that we're on right now from a society standpoint. And then you went off to business school and all that kind of stuff. And, and what we're going to do right now is we're going to flip everybody's awareness here. So we've just been talking about the early 2000s lifestyle of American physicians. And, and Chris and I want you to know that the dominant influence on that lifestyle is the revenue model of the practice that they're in. So we're in the United States of America, where we have multiple, usually 20 or 30 different insurances you're going to take, all of which have their own rules about how you submit, all of which have great big teams of people denying your claims and denying your pre-authorizations and making your life a living hell, because then you've got to document all the stuff they ask you to do. So what we're going to talk about is taking you into a completely different revenue model typically known as DPC, direct primary care, but specialists can do it too. And it just so happens, just some quick definitions. If I'm going to charge a patient, direct primary care means you're going to pay me directly to take care of you as your primary care doctor. If I charge you a monthly subscription, typically that's called concierge medicine. And now I want to just clarify, that's a completely inaccurate term. Concierge implies like 24-7, you know, the kind of stuff you would get at the Ritz-Carlton if you were on vacation kind of care. That's not true. Concierge is just a term for somebody who pays a subscription for their direct primary care. No insurance companies. Your patient is your customer, not the insurance. There's no third party in the room that you have to satisfy all of their requirements. And what this does is absolutely magic to your practice experience. So Chris, give us DPC Transformation 101, what it makes possible when we keep our overhead down and we, and we contract with the patient directly. Long story short, make twice as much money, see a fifth of the patients, and you get to go home and see your family during nights and weekends. Stop, and stop, stop, time out. What did he just say? I'm going to slow that down make twice as much money seeing one fifth of the patients. Let's just do a little exercise. All of you who are employees listening to this right now, I want you to go back and get your collections, your collections, monthly collections for the last month, and then look at the total value of your take-home pay and benefit package for those three months and see what the overhead is as an employee. What percentage of what you are what is being collected from your billings is going into your pocket? You're going to see it's right around 30%. What we're going to do is flip that. What's the average overhead of your DPC doctors? 
about 30 percent about 30 percent now you're taking home 70 percent. that's why you don't have to see so many patients guess what you're your own boss too yikes <laughs> so so hang on a second and in every town in America, there are direct primary care doctors and concierge doctors who charge a, subs a subscription fee for this service. However, it's not been easy because you had to figure it out for yourself. That's where Chris comes in. So tell us a little bit about Freedom Health Works and how this works. We got this idea that this is the way that medicine should be practiced. This is the way that medicine was practiced. So we're not inventing something new. All we did was take a lot of different pieces off the bookshelf and say, you know what? This is a great way for a doctor to enjoy practicing medicine again. We've talked about it. Medicine is a calling. It's not a career, right? You have to, you, you're not going to be like leaving medicine and say, oh, I'm going to go become a motorcycle mechanic, hobbies aside. You're doctors. This is the best and brightest people, most empathetic. You're here for a reason is to take care of your fellow human beings. So what we did was say, how do we make this so easy where a doctor doesn't have to come out here after you know working seven days on, seven days off at a hospital, or you know working fourteen hours a day, seeing so many people, or get an MBA for heaven's sakes, <laughs> or oh my gosh, so, so here you got me now you got me because you know fired up here. When did the ideal dream career in medicine become getting an MBA and moving into administration? That is just nuts to me. I don't know why we're pushing so many talented MDs to then move into administration where they just become figureheads and they're completely neutered. They don't have any power. They're just there to make sure the rest of the dozens or hundreds of physicians are happy and hitting arbitrary metrics that don't mean anything in patient care. It, it just, it, it is a pet peeve of mine when physicians feel compelled to go to business school. I've been to business school. It was great for me and what I wanted to do. But if I was sitting there taking care of people and healing people, that would never, ever been on my radar at all, at all. And so, um, yeah, so what we did was design a platform, a service that said, let's make it as easy as possible to bring all these different components of business startup. And, you know, Dr. Evan, I tell people all the time because they say, well, doctors just aren't good at starting businesses. And I go, time out, full stop. Nobody's really good at starting a business because there's so much that you don't know. I go, case in point. I wouldn't go down to downtown Indianapolis and start selling hot dogs on the circle because I'm probably going to get sued. I might get arrested. I might make somebody sick. I don't know how to actually start a hot dog stand. So the last place I'm going to look is on the internet to try to figure out what's going on. I'm going to call attorneys. I'm going to call accountants. I'm going to call Department of Health. I'm going to start getting all these pieces together in order for me to go do that. So no business, or there are very few businesses that are easy to start on your own. Practicing medicine is one of those where there's a lot of hoops to jump through. And for us to be able to give you a package, give you a 90-day launch and say, here you go, here's all the different things that you need. So at the end of these 90 days, you have a practice who's going to be accepting money from patients. You have a happy patient, and then we're going to be able to grow from there. You're not going to get in trouble with Medicare or CMS or commercial payers or anything on those lines. You're going to have one employee. You're going to have yourself. And you're going to be loving life again and your family will actually get to know you. And that's, it, it's something that can be very, very magical. Well, and we were talking earlier, you've been doing this for how long and launched how many different practices? First practice went live in December of 2016. And so here we are halfway through 2023 and we've launched over 130 practices in 37 states across the United States. So, so nobody is participating in your learning curve at this point. You've got the systems down. You've dialed up practices before. These are things that you've taught multiple doctors before. You can even teach a doctor how to work it. You were talking too about being able to help people stand up the actual facility, the actual practice building where they're going to work. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So when we start a practice and we help a doctor start, um, we know that we're not going to come in there and force them to use everything that's under the sun. What we're able to do is front run and say, here are the best systems to use right now. Um, I know from experience that trying to mandate an EMR is a losing battle, and I don't even want to have that fight. So we give you two or three of them that are the best direct care EMRs out there right now, let you use them, let you pick, and then we go around with that. So our process, you know, while it might seem very linear, 
there's a lot of decision points where we want your input. We need your input because we're not going to force this upon you. This is your practice. You have to be able to understand your systems. You have to be understand how to talk to your patients. And so we have a ton of support services that will help facilitate things like lead generation. We'll answer your phones for you. But ultimately, we're going to put that patient in front of you after we've trained you how to talk about it and all the good fun stuff you need to say to get them in the boat. But ultimately, it's you. You have to make that decision whether you want to accept this patient or say, hey, look, I, I can't take care of you. Somebody else can, maybe something like that. But we don't want to run into scenarios where you as a physician are unable to speak intelligently about your practice because that has long-term implications to the success of your business. And so with a recurring revenue model, you have a budgetable subscription. Subscription. Yeah. So you have, you know, you know what you're going to make that month. You're able to budget against it. You're able to build a financial literacy that you just probably wouldn't be exposed to any type of a hospital format. And so we get to, you know, again, take pleasure. I, I enjoy doing this, you know, so uh, sometimes I get talking a little fast because I just so passionate about it, but we get to take doctors and reinsert them into their communities and make them happier because that shines through on the patient care side of it. So there's really no, you know, go back to answer your question. There's really no stone that our process leaves unturned. And so, and when we get a doctor, you know, right now as a state of medicine, most of the physicians we work with are coming out of employment with a hospital or large system. And so they need a new place to, to practice. And so, you know, we work with real estate partners of ours to either find a building or put you into a lease and get you a storefront, all that kind of fun stuff so that patients can come see you. And we don't want anybody to be lost when they walk into your office. And this office just exudes your personality. So it's someplace that you enjoy coming into that looks completely different from most typical hospital-based doctor's offices. And uh, it, it it's really amazing to watch a physician's world broaden when they get to put their own personality into their practices, because we have to fight that mindset that they are commoditized. Right. And so many insurance companies and so many hospitals look at a doctor and say, here's your white coat, here's your stethoscope, go take a picture over there. And then we'll give people a choice from a list and, they're, and the patient's just gonna start clicking numbers and see when they can get in to see you. And the humanity is taken out of that decision completely. And that is just so wrong, in my opinion. So what ends up happening is you have patients who pay you to provide healthcare services to them. It may be on a monthly subscription. Uh, recurring revenue is what they call it in the business world. It may be on a cash payment that is somewhere in the vicinity of their copay to see you for an individual service. But you get to decide as the doctor what the package of services are that you offer your patients. You get to decide whether or not you, you tell them, I'm, I'm available for 24-7 access by phone. You may not do that. You may decide that, hey, emergency rooms and urgent care centers are where you're going to need to go. And you let the patient know that really clear. You get to define the scope of your practice. But it's your practice. And since you don't have a 70% overhead, on average, how many patients a day do your docs see, and how much time do they have with each patient? A full practice will max out anywhere from 500 to 600. And so we build our default financial scenarios based on a four day work week with 500 patients because average you see somebody, you see the same patient in person about four times a year. And so that's how we, we look at this and say, okay, maybe we can take 600 because you want to work five days a week. But on average, you see about six to eight people in person a day, uh, visits anywhere from 30 minutes to 60 minutes, again, depending on how you want to structure that. We just make sure there's fire breaks built in there so that you actually are not just sprinting from room to room. Um, and then you're probably going to be interacting with about 15 to 20 people via text message, um, emails, that type of a thing. So virtual is very much built into the DNA. We, you know, coming through the pandemic actually, you know, made us a lot stronger. Um, we like to joke that hospitals do our job for us. So during the pandemic, <laughs> hospitals were firing veteran doctors because they couldn't see anybody in person. So their business model was built on physical interaction. 
now you have government shutdowns, you have a government shutting down businesses, and you're like, well, I can't bill insurance because I didn't see this person. Our practice has thrived because we had virtual aspects built through there as a supplement to the care. And I want to be very clear about that because we get a lot of physicians who say, well, I, I work for big virtual um, you know, providers and big virtual networks, and I just want to do virtual. And we say, look, we're not the shop for you. Right. And so where we sit, it is our duty to let a physician know if it's not a good fit for what we see. And, you know, that's a tough conversation. It, it really is because we have doctors who say, hey, this sounds great. I want to do this. But if you don't have a network to pull on or a community or, you know, there's certain there's certain uh, parameters where we've seen doctors struggle in the past before and we don't want to go down that path for you anymore. So we want to give you all the tools that, that we possibly can in order to be successful for it. But like you said, a, a day in the life, it's really low volume practice really high quality because you get to know the patient, you get to know their family, you get to know their history, and that helps our doctors stay ahead of any type of conditions or any disease states. As you know, most physicians tell me, it's like, you look at family history, you look at lifestyle, and that pretty much paints the story for what's gonna happen next. Well, and, and you get to over time, as you and your patients can relax into this slower pace of your relationship, you get to actually begin to practice health care rather than sick care. And let's let's answer another question that's probably in some people's minds. Well, what about if they need surgery or hospitalization or chemotherapy or stuff like that? Well, that's what their insurance is for. We're not saying that this is in place of insurance. This is an overlay on top of your insurance. And then Let's just speak for just a little second because you have a vision and, and I, I can understand your vision and I believe I agree with it. There's a lot of people that will. What do you think healthcare is going to look like in five years? Right now, by the way, 55% of American physicians or 45% of American physicians are over the age of 55. We've already lost 100,000 in the last year. We're going to lose three or 400,000 boomer docs between now and 2030. And um, the question is, what is the healthcare delivery system, especially with regards to primary care, especially rural primary care, look like in America at that point in time? How do you see DPC fitting in here? What's your vision? I think DPC is the only practice model that can satisfy rural healthcare. Um, it is the only business model out there, practice model, that can work in small towns. Most insurance-based practices need 3,000, 4,000 lives in order to be functional. And most hospitals will lose money on that practice at that volume anyways. Our practices of 500 people can go into pretty much any town in the United States and thrive and have a monopoly on that market. So there's a business case there too. In five years, you know, and selfishly, I want to have 1,000 practices with our you know, Freedom Doc branding on that so that we can help physicians enter into this in a more smooth manner. In the future, you know, we, see, we see a lot of battle right now between MDs, DOs versus nurse practitioners, PAs. I, in my opinion, there's room for everybody on the bus. Let the market go out there and choose. But I would say that hospitals, and we've already started seeing this, hospitals are replacing physicians with mid-level providers. Now that that's they're doing what they want to do, but if I'm an MD or a DO and I know about this model and know the value that I'm able to bring to a community, why would I ever want to go work for a hospital other than I am so dependent on that paycheck that I don't have another choice? And so, you know, I think that we're going to see a bifurcation. I think a lot of insurance uh, based practices will be going towards nurse practitioners, PAs even maybe some other professional designation that I don't even know about right now. And I think we'll see, we'll see a shift back towards independence for physicians in the very near future. Right on, right on. Well, um, how can people get a hold of you? How can they contact you and have some initial conversations about what this looked like in their practice? We have a couple of uh, pathways for doctors. So Freedom Health Works is the parent company. And really, that is geared towards physicians that want to go out there and start their own practices and have their own name on the door and kind of build it you know, according to their what we call dream practice state. We also have a new concept called Freedom Doc, 
And I'm really excited about this one because what that does is give physicians who want to experience this model, that gives them a nice soft landing where they get a stipend from us in order to set up their practice. So they don't go back to zero from an income standpoint. And that's being very, very popular um, so far. And we've only been doing that for about six months. So it's hot off the presses. So we got Freedom Health Works, freedomhealthworks.com. And then we have Freedom Doc, which is freedomdoc.care. It's kind of choose your own adventure. Um, like I said early on that we never want to be able to box. We never want to be a position to box a physician in. We want to give them options that suit them best and suit their care philosophy the best. Uh, and, you know, we talk about primary care right now, and that's family docs, internal, pediatrics. Specialties are looking at these primary care docs, and probably for the first time in U.S. medicine, are super jealous of what they're doing. Usually it's the other way around, but there's room on the bus for specialists, too, as we create really an alternate choice for patients out there. Um, I'm not some guy who's saying, coming out here and saying, I want this to replace what we have out there because there's there are people who need those safety nets, and I get it. This is an option for people who want to form that relationship with their physicians, and this is an option for physicians who want to really practice medicine in the way that they were trained, the way that they know how to, and the way that they want to. And so yeah. if we can give options to everybody up and down that spectrum, I'm going to be a happy camper. Right on. And imagine a situation where you're talking to the patient and you think the patient needs something and you provide it to them and there's no insurance second guessing that has to go on. Is it a covered services? Is it on my formulary? All that kind of stuff. So direct, direct doctor to patient. Who's paying the doctor? The patient. Nobody in the middle telling you what to do or increasing the complexity of your practice. So Chris, this is awesome. So freedomhealthworks.com, freedomdoc.care, direct primary care and specialists too. You might want to talk to them about your specialty practice. It's an old school practice. It's a return to the good old days where you get to define what you do for your patients and you get to lower your own overhead to make sure that you can conduct your practice at the cadence that you're comfortable with, rather than always being driven to see more and more on behalf of the overhead of your overlords in your employer. Wow. This is awesome. I'm going to be watching you real close, brother. Any last thing you want to say? Burnout is a serious, serious problem. So I appreciate what you do here, Doc. It, it, uh, we see it day in, day out. And I, I call it moral injury. I mean, any other any other career, there would be lawsuit after lawsuit of what most of these employers are putting physicians through. And so if we're able to help fix burnout by creating, or by actually really just making physicians their own boss, that is the best way that we have seen time and time again to help solve burnout is to help physicians be their own boss. And we want to be the easiest way to be your own boss. Right on. Chris Habig, Freedom Health Works. That's it for today. Everybody keep breathing till I see you on the next podcast. Dyke Drummond in Seattle, Washington at the home of thehappymd.com. See you next time on the podcast. Yeah.